Welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels basketball podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're watching us on our rapidly growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime college AAU and high school coach, Mr. David Siska. David, we haven't discussed the Tar Heels since I guess after the Duke game. So it's been two and a half weeks or so since we've uh, spoken about the heels. And since we last talked, they've had games against what? Uh, Fl- Florida State, uh, P- uh, excuse me, Florida State, Pittsburgh, Virginia Tech, and Louisville, I think is what it is. These games are piling up as we get close in on the postseason here in a couple of Florida weeks. Florida State, so, Pitt, yeah, Florida State, Pitt, Virginia Pitt. Tech, Louisville, yeah. Uh, and Clemson, we forgot about Clemson. That's and Clemson, we had Clemson that Tuesday. Uh, we had a Tuesday night down at Clemson. so in order: Clemson, Florida State, Pitt, Virginia Tech, Louisville. And what we've seen from Carolina in those five games, which all five were very, very winnable for the Tar Heels. Quite frankly, five teams that are not very good, other than Virginia Tech's a solid team, and it was on the road, raising the degree of difficulty some. But the Tar Heels beat a bad Clemson team by two. They routed an FSU team because everything they threw up went to the basket and the Seminoles were ravaged by injuries. The horrible performance at home against Pittsburgh. They went to Virginia Tech and gritted one out. I thought that was maybe Hubert's best coaching job this year. Tar Heels showed some some grit and that was a good win. And then Tuesday night, Tuesday, Monday night against Louisville, a team that's playing out the string although I think they had a little angst for Carolina because of what happened a few weeks ago at the Yum Center. They certainly played hard, and the Tar Heels did not play very well, but managed to close out 10-3 over the last six minutes. They did some good things defensively. So even though Carolina's 28, David, I think if we're looking at games and they do some good things in healthy snippets that's a, and get a win, that's a positive you move forward with because I think 28 games in, this team is still very much in the developmental process. Yeah, I think all of it's positive. I mean, they've won 20 games. Uh, it's more than one last year. Of course, last year was a COVID year. You've got to take that in consideration. But that team in a COVID year lost more than this team's lost so far as we, we close out down toward the end. Um, you know, there's a distinct possibility. Uh, you know, I, I think you would think if they lose at Duke um, – and lose a turn a game in the ACC tournament, and then win a game, lose a game in the NCAA tournament. I think that's eleven losses, which yeah. I think matches what they had last year. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's been a better year. But I, I think the whole thing is right now. You know, we've heard people in the most desperate stages say, "Blow it up, bench the starters, play the bench." You know, start all those five guys. I think you got to keep in mind what your goal for this team is. We listen. We know this team's not Gonzaga. Okay, this team's not Purdue this year, but. I think it's big to get to the NCAA tournament. I think that's what the goals are, you know, get to the NCAA tournament and look, anything can happen. I mean, look how many double digit seeds the last few years have come out. All all you've got to do is get hot at the right time. The other team uh, can struggle. And the next thing you know, you're in sweet 16. So, you know, we've seen it before. Uh, from other teams. And so North Carolina still got a lot to play for. And, you know, right now the major goal is get to the NCAA tournament. And, and unless they absolutely just go off the rails, I, it looks like that's going to happen. The, things, the last thing I saw from Joe Lenardi was, I think, uh, you know, they're a 12 seed, but I think that they're that, that uh, not the first four in, even though they're 12, but they're ne- that next four. So, it appears they have some breathing room, so they just got to keep, you know, they got to keep winning the games they're supposed to win. All except Pitt, they've done that this year. You know, they've had some more people have been down on them on maybe having games they didn't show up and some really bad losses on the scoreboard. Um, but it, with the exception of Pitt, they, they they've not been beaten by anybody they were, they were really supposed to uh, uh, win. You know, so and people might disagree with Miami and Wake Forest, but. I think North Carolina would beat Miami at in Chapel Hill. I think they're probably an underdog on the road. Same thing with Wake Forest. Yeah, you know, I think I they didn't show up, but you know, but still, th- those were two road games where they they're probably not the favorites. You know, in, in the big scheme of things. So, like I said, they're winning the games they're supposed to win, with well, exception of, of one maybe. So, um, twenty wins. They still got three left in the regular season, and. 
like I said, the, the goals get to the NCAA tournament and, and, you know, they're making a push toward that. And, and avoid Dayton. I don't think this club would, this club needs to, they need to, they need something dangling in front of them to race around the track. Right. And I, I, I don't think Dayton would excite this team a whole lot, unfortunately, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I do think that this club has a little bit more identity now than it did the week that it was in Coral Gables in Winston Salem, maybe Dawson Garcia leaving. Not that that's a, an, a, a positive, but it kind of forced them to sort of uh, narrow things a little bit more and just Hubert base would say, look, this is our iron five. We're going to, Roll with a couple dudes off the bench, you know, depending on the situation. One day it's Puff getting 12 minutes. Another day it's Kerwin Walton getting 12 minutes. This is kind of who we are. So I think they know that. And because of that, I actually think they've gotten better the last couple of weeks. And they've handled some situations maybe better than they would have previously. Yeah. And, um, you know, there you, you talked about the identity, they do have an identity, and we'll get into that. We've spoken about that on the podcast. The identity's not changed. No. Um, they're getting a little bit better at what they do, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, when I w- watch them, um, you know, you're talking about, first of all, you know, that bench play. Um, a lot of those guys, it, it probably makes it tough because a lot of those guys are bigger wings, you know, and really yeah. leaky, puff. They're kind of the same position, kind of the same guys a little bit. Uh, uh, or not Leaky, I said. I meant uh, Dontre Styles. I'm sorry. Dontre Styles and Pup. Dontre is a lot more athletic. Uh, they're a little different, but they're the lengthy wings. Kerwin Walton's a bigger guard that can shoot the three. They're a little different, but they all kind of fit into that bigger wing role, shooting guard, small forward role. So, uh, when you look what he goes to the bench, you, you basically got the same spot. It's not like he's bringing in another big or he's bringing in, you know, a secondary ball handler or something like that, you know, to, to give them a break at the point. It's like they're kind of top heavy at the wing. So, you know, it is what it is. And I do think probably he's, he's handcuffed a little bit, you know, on the bench. Uh, one other thing I would say, and, and I said this you know, on the last show we did, and it was right after a couple of games after Dawson Garcia left. And I don't mean this a slight toward anybody, but and, and but I feel like Brady Mannix freed up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, he's not looking over his shoulder. And, you know, early in the year, he didn't have consistently good games. He would have a good game. Garcia would have a subpar game. Then Garcia, when Garcia had a good one, Mannix would have a bad one. And it kind of affected playing time. And I think – Probably the result, like I said, looking over their shoulder, maybe not totally comfortable, but now it's Brady Manic show. And, you know, I'm doing some film review right now as we speak, and, and I, I've done a couple of clips. I'm going to do some more when we get done here. And the big thing that I've seen, I, you know, watch, went back and watched the last eight, nine minutes again and all the way down to the to the final horn. You know, Brady Manic made two huge plays last night. You know, he had to pull up jumper on the baseline. And then he, um, there was the back cut that led to Baycott's dunk. He had a big back cut against Virginia Tech where he dunked the ball, which is kind of similar. Um, really good basketball IQ. His man's head's turned. He back cuts on the baseline, gets the ball to rim. So, uh, you know, he's, he's really, you know, I remember Gigi Jackson's dad telling me before the year started, um, you know, he, and, and, and I take that back. It was, and it was Simeon Wilcher's dad. They came down, it was Sergio. And he said, you know, we were talking about kind of looking at the bigs and some things. And he said, man, he I, he said, the man's going to be manic. He's going to be really good. And, you know, I, I think they've got to be very thrilled with what they've gotten out of him. Yeah, if they were going to have to lose one of the two, I think that they have the guy that they are better off having. And again, that's not a slight to Dawson at all. But I think that I, I, I really like how the other guys have become very comfortable with Brady. Armando and Brady kind of picked it up in January. They started showing some pretty good cohesion. Lately, it's been Caleb and Brady. And that pass that RJ threw to him that began that sequence last night, RJ to Brady, Brady to Armando for the dunk that I think was was a backbreaker in a lot of ways. Even though it only put him up three, I think psychologically – uh, that really affected Louisville. 
Uh, in fact, I think Louisville caught a timeout and Armando did a little stare down to Malik Williams after that. And, and RJ knew Brady was going to cut. Brady's a good baseline player. And when you have a guy that could play on the baseline and could score in that reverse layup and also pass from the baseline or under the basket, that really opens so much up. Because if a guy's got the ball on the, ba- on the baseline, the defense is moving. Dudes are moving. That means somebody's getting open. Brady has shown an ability – if he if the scoring option isn't there cleanly, he can find guys. And that was a beautiful play last night. And it got the building going. And Caleb said afterward that, man, you know, that just juiced them. Like they they were struggling. They had heavy legs. And there was a minute and a half left. And in a close game, anything could have happened. I don't think this club wanted to be in a last shot situation last night, especially after, you know, the how they played against Pitt. You couldn't afford that kind of a game. I think they would have been tight. That loosened everybody. That gave them juice. That loosened them. And that was a great play all the way around. I'll go back to the next play after that. So it's 63-60. And this is the next play I got to go to when we get done here. So it's 63-60. They bring the ball down. It it was Caleb Love's drive from the left wing where he drives across the lane, scores with the right hand at the bucket. The first guy on top was Brady Manning. So the defense is split. His guy can't help off. He's got to stay on Manic, and that gives Love the the lane to get to the rim. Now, they did a poor job. They had Leaky Black on the right wing. That guy should have helped, uh, but he stayed wide. Now, that, that was a bad defensive um, move right there, decision. But Manic's the next guy from Love, so Caleb's got a lane because you cannot help off Brady Manic. So the thing I really like about him is versatility. Cutting along the baseline, really good passer, especially into the post. Steps out, hits a three, spreads the floor, gives the guards room. Um, you know, it's bring a lot to brings a lot to the table. Caleb Love, I think, has scored twenty plus points in nine games this year. I have to look that back up, but I, but I know that he's had five or more assists in twelve games, and the Tar Heels are twelve and zero when he does that. Now he had five against Louisville and seven turnovers, but the stat line that we're focusing on are the assists and the points. When he scores 20 or more, they win. When he hands out five or more assists, they win. I I don't recall a Carolina player who has had as many high-end performances as Caleb has, who also combines them with the low-end performance he does, that gets as much crap from the fan base as this guy does. And you as an analyst, a guy that has no emotional attachment to any of this stuff, when you watch Caleb play, is it maddening for someone with a completely unbiased view? I have an unbiased view as well, but I have to write about the kid every day. And to me, I don't see the maddening element of it. I just I just write what he does. It doesn't yeah. affect me one way or the other. Is it maddening to you as a guy who watches the game with a lens that very few people have? Yeah, and and I just know this from, from coaching high school ball. You know, you, you'll look at some guy and, and – it happens a lot in high school, especially if you're coaching a team where you've got a guy that's got to do a lot. You know, you see those guys carry the team, and they're not ACC type players or high major type players, but they get doubled and tripled all the time. They'll end up with 25 points and 12 turnovers. You know, you see that all the way. I've had plenty of them. Uh, and it does. It dry. It, it does. It does. It, it, it. You know. It, you as a coach. You want to put them in, in places where they can succeed and where they can make good plays. But when you do that, you want to try to grow the good plays and you want to try to decrease the bad plays, eliminate the weaknesses, build strengths. And, you know, when when the, the uh, weaknesses don't eliminate, there's still a lot of them there. You know, it breeds inconsistency. And for, there's one thing that coaches want. I think fans do too, especially when they're – emotionally attached like you said they want to they want to know what they're going to get you know they want consistency so you know when you don't get it and you're just you know your life depends on it you know whether you're going to have a good day at work or or you know you and your wife are going to speak to each other it's going to revolve around whether your basketball team wins or not uh you know you uh there's a lot of that unfortunately there's a lot of that I've, i've always said when i grew up and in East Tennessee, or Tennessee football game in the fall, uh, if Tennessee football won, 
we'd have about 400 people at church the next day and Tennessee football lost, you would have about 75. So it, it never, you know, that, 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 and it's, it's, I think it's that way a lot of places, but yeah, they want that. I'm going to say this about Caleb, two things that I've seen and going back, I, I mean, I really thought he dug in defensively. I thought him and RJ both dug in defensively, man. They challenged, they got over ball screens. They pressured the ball. That's not late. And I think that was a big difference in the game. Jay Billis felt like it was, you know, and listen to his commentary. Uh, some big possessions for Louisville, man, and the guards just couldn't get anywhere. They were up in them. And the other thing, too, that him and RJ are doing, and I, I, I talked about it at the Virginia Tech game, and I looked again last night, and looked, the first thing I'm doing is looking at the two-point shooting numbers from the guards. That's the first thing I'm doing. Um how do they, you know, are they going two for 10 or what? And that's one thing we did earlier. You know, they had so many of those games where Caleb's really shooting low percentage. They're starting to finish more in a lane and around the bucket the last two or three games. So that's one thing I've seen. I've been watching. So, yeah, if you want to pause it and say, is there an upper, maybe an upwards trend with Caleb Love? That's one thing I've noticed. He's, you know, he is starting to score more in a lane around the rim. And if he can do that – that can be big for this North Carolina team because they can shoot the outside shot. They can score to rim with, with they got a guy in there, Kneet and Baycott. You know, they just need their guards to score on the drive a little bit. And, and that, like I said, they, the last two games, they've kind of picked that up. Another thing that Caleb, I think, has done better of late is his decision making when he goes into the lane. He's not get you know, he gets a shot blocked every game, but he's not you know, driving into three people and, and hitting a wall and, and falling to the ground like some old cartoon character, like in the road runner where they hit the hit the bridge and then splat. He's not doing that anymore. He's kicking the ball out to the wing. He's finding guys in corners and at the wing when he goes in the lane. He's getting a decent chunk of his assists on three balls after kicking out from the lane. Have you seen that part of his game grow as well? Yeah, and you should know – what you have there, because if I looked at the numbers right over the weekend, I think I, I think North Carolina was 15th in the country, and yeah. it may have been higher. If I'm missing it, I'm, I'm missing it on a low end. They were 15th in the country, three-point shooting percentage. So, you know, just driving and making those kicks, if you draw it, you just got so many good shooters around you. So, you know, that's, that's a huge deal. So I, I think – you got to recognize that. I don't know as far as driving his feet to the post, but, you know, the kickouts, absolutely, because North Carolina's got the guys can do that. One thing that uh, I was talking with a couple of sports writers after the game uh, Monday night out on the parking lot. It was so nice and warm. We stayed out there and talked for a while. And we were talking about the guards, about Caleb and RJ, about how, you know, sometimes you know five or six dribbles before they're going to shoot that they're going to shoot. And uh, one of the guys recalled what John Calipari said in Las Vegas. He said, you kind of know when those guys are winding up. They, you know, they're, 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 they're yo-yoing, but they're not really yo-yoing. They're just trying to find a scene where they could get off a sometimes off-balance, a sometimes not off-balance jumper from beyond the arc. When you see, when you see that in either one of them, because they both do it, how how – head scratching is that to you and as a coach how do you get a guy whose instincts are to score 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 and i could beat anybody off the dribble i could beat two people off the dribble three people off the dribble for getting that out of them so they know when to pick and choose when to do that but not do it as often as the two of them do i think a lot of this is trying to figure out what hubert davis offensive philosophy is in the long run how much of a green light does his guys have? And, 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 you know, I've heard you before defend me on Twitter and other places when, you know, I've kind of took some guys to task on bad three-point decisions, bad three-point shots. And and you you talk, and I think you've made a statement in the past, David's talking about the decision-making here and the, uh, you know, whether or not these are high-percentage shots, not necessarily that they're three-pointers. Um, so my question is how much of a green light do they get? Because North Carolina shoots a lot of threes. They shot 25 last night. And let me say this while we're on it. 
the, a couple of these games I've not got to watch. We we've had high school games while these games are going on. And um, so I've, I've, I've not got to see some of them during the week, but I can go back and I've got an idea. If I look at the score, I've got an idea like the pit game. I looked at it. I said, okay, I can tell you what happened. They didn't make threes. Baycott didn't score inside. He's had an off night. And sure enough, that's what it was. And you look at them last night, they're seven for 25 and three. Baycott had 12, but you only took – had eight field goal attempts, you know. And, and to me, that's one problem I have. Baycott's not getting a lot of – he didn't have many. He had one field goal attempt in the first half, Virginia Tech. He's not shooting a lot. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, they shoot so many threes. You know, Alabama, I attended an SEC game here a couple of weeks back in Tuscaloosa. Alabama went three for 30 from – from three, it kept kept Jack, but that's what Nate Oates does. Yeah. And where I was at, I had a perfect angle to rim, and there weren't many shots that they shot where I'm saying, "Man, that ball's going in," and it missed. I mean, you, when it left her hand, you're like, "I don't, that's not going to draw iron." A lot of them, but they kept jacking them. And uh, so, he, like I said, my question is, how much uh, freedom is Hubert Davis giving the guards? Because I, I I know I don't think Roy Williams gave them, uh, uh, you know, really too much wiggle room there to shoot yeah. all those. Yeah. And one thing North Carolina does this year, they shoot a lot more threes. So, in doing so, then you're talking a fine line. You're giving these guys a green light. You're letting them create. Sometimes you have to take good shot decisions with with bad shot decisions. So, how much emphasis is there? Yeah, I want us to shoot a bunch of threes. And Hubert said it. We are a jump shooting team. Yeah. Then Baycott eats inside. That's what we do. So I, I don't know that he's out there telling them no, 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 no. You miss this three pointer. You don't. You take it. And you miss it. You're coming out. I don't see any of that. So you that, mentioned got a green light. So you know they've got. There's a fine line there. You got to walk. Yeah, but sometimes shouldn't the green light flicker a little? Shouldn't it turn it go yellow and go red every once in a while? And I well, say that. Based on the I heard a comedian say one time, he said, "You ever try to run a yellow light? And the guy in front of you chickens out." So, you know, you, uh, <laughs> you, uh, so you know that could be it. Like you say, it could flicker. I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not in practice, and that's one thing. I'm not in the locker room. Um, I don't know. Uh, like I say, there, there's when you're shooting a lot of threes, and you give them complete, free, you give them. A lot of freedom, a lot of green light. I don't know how much that green light flickers. I don't know. You brought up Armando, and I wanted to go there as well. Last, uh, let's see, Monday night, Monday night was the fourth consecutive game in which he has not attempted double digit number of shots in a game. Now he's lost the ball. His hands have been a little off lately. He's, he's lost the ball a couple of times down low, but even if those would have been shot attempts, he would have had eight instead of seven or nine instead of eight. What's interesting is that I think it's eight times now this year in a game he hasn't had double-digit shot attempts. And in the the other four, I believe it was, he was at nine and three of them. And one of them was a game that they won in a route, so they didn't have to go through them a lot. I think for this team to be more of a threat moving forward, to A, have a chance in Durham, B, have a chance in Brooklyn, and C, have a chance in the NCAA tournament to advance to the second weekend, they need to run stuff through him because he's proven to be a willing passer. He dribbles out of double teams really well. His head's up. He's got a real good perception of what's going on on the floor. And he doesn't – he's not one of those guys that feels like he has to take 15, 17 shots a game to feel like he's in the game. But he can be a high percentage 12 shot guy and also get fouled and go to the line. And he hasn't been going to the line as much lately either. How important is it for this team to run, to make a concerted effort to run more stuff through the post? Because if it's not there, the shots that they're taking without that running through the post are still going to be there. That's a perfect rotation from the last question, Andrew. We talked about the green lights on three point shots, and then we go into Baycott not getting looks. Well, one determines the other. Yeah, And that's why I – the North Carolina State game, the Florida State game, I didn't get – like you said, I'm not emotionally invested. I didn't get – I wouldn't have got hyped up over that 
if if I would have painted my body Carolina blue, and 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 my my real my last name was I mean my name was Dean Smith the third, you know, and with I, a Roy I, Williams tattoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't have I I wouldn't have got pumped about that because. It's fool's gold. Yeah. You know, when you're playing those teams, they don't defend. They're they're just, you know, it looks like I, I you know, I've watched North Carolina State and Florida State this year, and I'm just like, man, what's what's going? I mean, they're they're not even invested. And you're just out there raining down threes and you get hot and you're in your home gym and the crowd's going nuts, and you can't wait to let that next one rain down. I'm sitting there looking, I'm going. Man, you got one of the best big men in the country in there, and you you, you just keep shooting twenty five foot threes off one foot. You, you don't that, get better in those games, do you? Bad, I don't mind the bad three misses as much as it's not the misses as much as Baycott not getting the ball yeah. when he could. See, I don't think it. you get better, David. I don't think you get better in those games. No, no. You know, ball. I've said this. Boston College, Georgia Tech. Uh, Florida State and Florida State's injury. I, I'll give yeah. you know Leonard Ham, but North Carolina State, those teams are train wrecked. Yeah. You know, yeah. Clemson, Clemson's yeah. terrible now, too. They're the, some of the worst power five teams I've ever seen. Yeah, and like you say, you don't, and that may be one reason in, in North Carolina's defense when they do get punched in the mouth. I've said this when you get punched in the mouth. There's a difference in Mike Tyson punching you in the mouth and some little guy out there just jabbing, dancing. Barney, jabbing. Barney Fife. The ACC's got a few Barney yeah, Fife. Yeah, exactly. When you get punched in the mouth and you can't respond, it's usually because you got punched pretty hard. Yeah. And you need that. You need the wars. And I don't know that they get the wars. And, and that's why I think one team, they're just not used to it. And you have to worry sometimes. Do you, you, and you, we talked about it before we went on the air that maybe, you know, they get in a rock fight last night with Louisville. They have twice. Louisville's not very good. And some of these teams, Clemson and all, do you play down to the level of competition and you're winning some close games? I think it's good that they can pull away and these, close games and pull away at the end. That's good. But, man, they need rock fights against good old-fashioned, tough ACC basketball. You know, when Virginia was Virginia and when Florida State was Florida State and teams like that, you know, that, that man, it was just ACC war every night. It toughens you up. And yeah. I just don't know how many teams in ACC can toughen them right now. Well, that's <clears throat> why I guess a lot of Carolina fans – I would say, given the way the season's played out, rightfully put a lot of stock in the win at Virginia Tech. I was there, and that's uh, that's the best atmosphere on the road they've played in this year. They've only played on the road in front of two full yeah. houses this year. Charleston was one of them. And Charleston w w was such a good atmosphere that Hubert references it a lot. Now, three of their ACC road games were when students were away. Georgia Tech, Notre Dame, and BC. And BC had, you know, Four and a half thousand people there, and three thousand were Carolina fans. But that was a big time atmosphere in Blacksburg, and for you to come off, I mean, just a pitiful, pitiful performance against Pitt. That's that's about as bad as this team. That's worse than anybody thought this team could play. And that's after having the the the, uh, the privilege of seeing them against Kentucky and Miami and some of those games. Right? They were worse against Pitt. Pitt was. Pitt's a terrible basketball team. Carolina was run out of their own building. But the respondent win on the road in a raucous environment against a desperate team that has guys. And I thought that Carolina defended the post really well that game. They showed some toughness, probably the best defensive game Brady Manick has played since he got to Carolina. And then Caleb Love did stuff late, wanted the ball late, did stuff late. I think that has to be their identity. And that, that game has to be their identity moving forward with a little bit more stuff through Armando. I just wish it was tougher than that. I, I, I'm not sold on Virginia Tech and Virginia. Yeah. Uh, you know, Virginia Tech, they miss them up. So they don't have creators at the That's true. 
they just don't look skilled in a post. They just look awkward when they make shots. They're big. They just just never looks fluid. But like you say, doing it on the road, and, and we know this, I think road environments in a lot of places, uh, I think, like you say, when they went to, to Boston College and some of these other spots, as a buddy of mine used to say, there's not enough people in here to disturb the peace. And, and you know, that was – you know, that was kind of the case. So, you know, you know now we got to say this, too, another thing in North Carolina's defense. Ken Palm had Clemson and Virginia Tech both as losses. So um, he's had them setting at, at uh, 11 regular season losses for probably two months right now. Then he had both of those as, you know, what would be losses. So, you know, they got a chance to get out with, you know, they'll play it under – well, they got a chance to get out with eight. But, you know, if Duke beats them, you know, and they could have – and they could end up, uh, what would it be, 23 nine. and 9, 22 and yeah. 9 yeah. on regular season. That's a pretty good – that's pretty good. And like I said, I've, I've – you know, I'm giving the team full credit because, um, like I said, the, the goals get to the NCAA tournament. And if you can do that, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of criticism that Hubert's had, you know, he, he could just kind of say, hey – Look at what we've done, you know, best record we've had, yeah. you know, first year. And, and I, I know it's not, a, you know, not been Final Four, but, you know, there's a lot of good things happen here. But like I said, I think a lot of the things that they could use to make them better, they've just not been privy to because the league's been bad. And I, I just think you've got to have – like I just think you've got to have those wars night in and night out to really, you know, toughen your hide up. And I think that's what makes the Virginia Tech game stand out because it – that w- – Virginia Tech would have been, you know, ninth or 10th in a normal ACC year. And that's still a quality win to get on the road. And for some reason, the NET loves the Hokies. You know, Virginia's got three quad one yeah. wins and they're 81. Yeah. You know, but they've, who got, those, but they've got those terrible losses. Back. They got Navy and JMU losses yes. that are hurting them. But I don't understand why the NET likes the, the Hokies so much. Well, Ken Palm does too. And, you know, just looking at it here. Hang on a second. So when I look at Ken Palm, they've got Virginia Tech 33 and Michigan 32. So, you know. uh, Michigan play, but Michigan has the strength of schedule going in their favor a lot because they they have six games left, four of them are Q1 games. But in the ACC, it's hard to make a move up because there's not a lot of value in the wins in the league. It's weird. They've got, I'm going to say this. Like I say, totally unbiased here. Virginia Tech, according to Ken Palm's 33, Michigan's 43. Now, explain it. Now, I'm going to say this. Like I said, totally unbiased. If North Carolina and Virginia Tech played 10 times, I think North Carolina winning eight is lowballing it. Yeah, I think I so, too. I agree. North Carolina beating them every time they played them. North Carolina is much more talented than Virginia Tech. And I watch Virginia Tech play. I don't think they play harder. I don't think they're – Mike Young's a good coach, but I don't see anything on this team this year to tell me he's any – he's well, done they, it. They, they don't have a 29-point loss to Kentucky in a neutral floor. They don't have a 28-point loss at Miami. They don't – they didn't They didn't get run out of their own building by Pitt. So, Carolina has ugly stuff that's affecting their resume. And quite frankly, at times, you know, when the Tar Heels have been in the 30s, they were before the Pitt game. Like, really? I mean, I – there are times they look like they're that good, like they can be that good. They you know, kind of remind – you know what, David, real quick? They kind of remind me of UCLA last year in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. And UCLA wasn't really – the team that we saw in the tournament didn't become that team until they hit the tournament. They showed flashes, but they were all over the place too. This Some of this stuff's crazy. So – and I'm looking at it here, and I'm just going to laugh here, and I'm getting off for it, but, but just, just to add ammunition to it. <laughs> no, it's all right. So Michigan's 32 and Virginia Tech's 33, all right? So North Carolina's 43. Providence is 22 and 3. And Providence is really good in the Big East and are 46th. Yeah, it's a good league. Uh, Florida just beat Auburn is is 51st. TCU is 17 and 8 in the Big 12. Which is probably one of the best conferences. Are fifty four? Notre Dame's fifty eight. How's Notre yeah. Dame? How is Virginia Tech twenty five spots ahead? Of Notre Dame was in first place in the league five days ago. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. I, sometimes I think all this analytical stuff just, just. Yeah. You know, the NET, they weigh on, they, they lean on a lot, but that's why I keep telling people, I really think when they discuss North Carolina, they're going to discuss the ugliness of those losses. When people were saying, boy, they don't have any bad losses. I think losing by 29 to anybody's bad, yeah. no matter where. I think losing by 28 and 22, those those losses that they had were bad losses with the exception of Purdue. And Notre Dame, I guess, in hindsight, is not a bad loss anymore, although I think North Carolina is more talented and should have won that game the time that the, when they went up there. But, but the pit thing is what, what's really going to stand out because they can't say they didn't that they didn't beat – that you can't say they beat everyone they were supposed to because they that that's a brutal loss. Pitt's a terrible team, probably going to have a new coach and, and have no reason to go into Chapel Hill and play the way they did. And I think that's the thing that with this North Carolina team, to me, the theme right now, and we've sort of done it a little bit in this podcast, is that they're 20 and eight. Caleb Love has all those really good games, et cetera, et cetera. But all people really want to do is fixate on the negative. Hubert doesn't play the bench enough. Caleb Boy, he could be just awful. People saying they should bench him and that kind of thing. And this team isn't worth a damn. But the 28, Caleb overall has posted some pretty impressive numbers. He, when he's really good, he's fantastic. And, you know, they've survived not playing a lot of the bench. They're winning these games and they're closing teams out. They were at their best in overtime against Louisville. They were at their best late in, at Clemson. They were at their best, you know, they charge back against Pitt. Caleb scored 15 points in a four minute span in that game. And they were at their best late in Blacksburg and they were at their best late against Louisville after logging all those minutes. There's something to say about that. Yeah. And they don't need they, these next two games, no matter what happens at Duke, they don't need to drop these next two in North Carolina state and Syracuse, you know, the rivalry of North Carolina state better than I do. And I, I, it's going to be it's going to be a zoo. Go in to Raleigh, anything can happen. You know, it's going to be. Now you talk about a hot. It doesn't matter if they don't win a game. I'm sure they're going to pack that place in there. I'm oh, sure they big have time. To. North Carolina, yeah, yeah, and that'll make their season. Um, and then you know, Syracuse comes in, you know, and they're just kind of zany team. They'll play that zone. They'll shoot up a bunch of threes, and you don't know what's going to happen. No matter you know how badly they're playing, so. Uh, they just got to win these next – I think these next two games are crucial. Like I said, get into the tournament, win these next two, and, and like I said, I think you're in. They don't need an ugly loss. They, I think North Carolina State and Ken Palm's like 128, 124, yeah. somewhere. They don't need to – even – it's, it's a Q2 two game need, right now, but it could end up Q3. Yeah, that that – there's a lot – it's one of those deals where there's a lot more bad can happen than good in one of those deals. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, being a, a, an 18 year old boy out at two o'clock in the morning, not a lot of good can happen. So that's kind of what it is. You're kind of, when you're going North Carolina state, you're kind of on the bad side of town and uh, of town and it's, uh, it's, it's laid out, you know, so. And just to, for clarification's sake, you're not calling Raleigh that you're just making a, 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 a point there about, what could happen in a game like that? Just take care of business. However, I'm going to go this much further on that. I think that they need to play well and win. They need to win. I've been saying all along, these guys just need to win. They need to pile up wins. But now that March is almost here, I do think it's important to play well going into that Duke game. This team needs to kind of get a little bit of a mojo. They need to know what it's like to back up a mojo performance with another mojo performance and get wins. And these next two games are opportunities to do that because they got to go into that zoo in Raleigh. It's going to be a wild atmosphere early. And then they got to play Syracuse, which I think is a, it's a tough team to play because they have enough shooters that the, the, the Orange, are, they're liable to come in and hit 18 threes. Or they're liable to come in and go three for 30 from three, like Nate Oates' team did when you saw them. That's a game that could swing 20 points either way based on how the Orange are. But the Tar Heels, can, can they, they can control their own play that night. And they have actually played pretty well against uh, Syracuse in recent years. I think playing well and feeling really good and getting that whole chemistry thing popping is really important if these teams going to have a chance to go in dur into Durham and get a win. Yeah, and, you know, build that momentum, keep it going. And, um, you know, like, like I said, 
each each thing offers a challenge. Now, like I said, North Carolina State's going to be a true road game. Syracuse, you know, with what they do, that zone, they got their own thing and they're different from mean by you play, and it never makes it easy. They're kind of like Wake Forest football with Dave Clawson, where the, where the offensive linemen stand up and don't block anybody, and it's a whole different look, and you're, you're just what in the world's going on here. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can kind of get that way against Syracuse. If they get you confused and they in that zone and they start knocking down some threes or just – like I say, they're 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 tough to play, and, and usually they're a lot tougher to play against late in the year than they are early. Yeah, that's true. And they have been playing better of late. They've been a better team the last month than they have been in, earlier in the season. And I could see them goading those guards into that five or six dribble windup that yeah. John Calipari was talking about. Yeah, and and a lot of teams do that in zone. You know, yeah. you get, of course. Now here's a little different, but I I, I kind of feel like. With Syracuse, man, they used to be so long back when they had those good teams. And I'm not even going back to Carmelo Anthony and 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 uh, uh, gosh, and his team, Pearl Washington, Derek Coleman, all them. I'm talking about five, six years ago. Yeah, it was so long. They'd get in the yeah. tournament, they'd barely get in, and every year they'd go to Sweet 16, Elite Eight, and make that. And- but for so long on that back end, and. So you got three guys in the back and fur there, and they stretch their arms out. I mean, they're going sideline to sideline and touching fingers. Well, and they and, just lost. They just lost one of their long guys for the year. One of many out for the year injuries in the league. Uh, you know, Carolina's actually played well against Syracuse, getting the ball in there and passing well. I think Brady Manick could it could be really uh, could have a really big game against that kind of zone. He hadn't seen anything like that before, and. He, I remember Isaiah Hicks had a huge game up at the Carrier Dome a few years ago, and and I could see Brady playing that kind of role. If the Tar Heels attack it the way that they did under Roy, I, they might not attack it the same way. It'll be interesting to see how they go about it. But, David, you know, we got a week and a half left of the regular season, and I'll be up in Brooklyn in a couple of weeks for the ACC tournament. Uh, I have a room I've already paid for for three nights, so I, I, I hope I'm working that long. <laughs> Speaking of the wrong side of town. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the great thing about, well, the great thing, the funny thing about the tournament being in Brooklyn is a couple of years ago when I was there in 18, uh, I got an Uber to the, Bar- the Barclays Center and uh, the guy dropped me off across the street. And he goes, are the Nets playing tonight? I mean, are the, the Islanders? No, it's ACC tournament. What's that? I mean, you're across the street. You have no idea it's going on. Which is unlike anywhere else. With the eight, when the ACC tournament's down here, where it should be, you know, when you're ten miles from the arena, the ACC tournament's going on. But up there, well, yeah. this is it's the just, whole. Thing. Just, it's just another thing happening. This is the whole thing of modern day college sports. Now, you're, you're, you know, it used to be geographically based leagues, and I'm yeah. just going to speak for this because I, I, to me, I, I go back and and. Yeah, I thought that the eighties were the glory days of basketball in, in college, but I can think back, man, you go back to North Carolina state, Maryland, and what was called the greatest game ever played yeah. with 103 to hundred. And there was no turnovers in the game, Maryland, North Carolina state. And you can go all the way back to lefty and think about those teams, then go up to Gary Williams. And, you know, Maryland was just a staple in the ACC and, now, you know, um, the ACC expands. You get more Northeastern teams. So, like you say, they're playing. They've played the Big Ten and the ACC tournament in New York City. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and the Big Ten, that makes no – you know, the Big Ten playing up there, it makes even less sense to me. Well, you, well, you got Rutgers in that area, but but yeah, – it, it, but Syracuse is a pro, is more the program in New York City than Rutgers is. People don't. You see some guys from Iowa, and places from Iowa, and Nebraska, roaming around up there in Manhattan. So well, I feel at home here, and and you know, uh, the they'll, SEC, be, they'll be like Brooks on Shawshank Redemption when he gets out, and the, uh, the cars are going too fast for him. <laughs> the, the SEC, you know, they went to St. Louis a couple years ago. And I know Missouri's in. And look, I have I got a real good friend who writes for you know as a uh, in the media of University of Missouri, and he tells me he says, it's just not a fit. 
uh, he said, we have no rivalries. You know, our rivals used to be Illinois and they're in Kansas and, you know, Kansas, Missouri is a great rivalry. And, you know, so the SEC tournament goes to St. Louis and as a waitress told me in, uh, in uh, Indianapolis one time, she said, Nashville ain't the South, honey. And St. Louis, St. Louis ain't either. So, you know, just, it, it's just weird the way all these tournaments go and you're, you're playing tournament geographically it's not a mix and it, it's just i don't know it's just got a different feel i'm like you when, I when you like to have it one time what you like for one more time to have maryland in the league yeah. and north carolina state's really good and duke's yeah. really good and north carolina's really good and maryland's real i'm talking top 10 good and you're playing in greensboro would you not like to have that andrew or even dc and no, some great tournaments no, up there. No, but it, but it, but the thing uh, is, DC DC was there. an ACC you're town. From up there. No, no, no. But DC was an ACC town when I lived there, and it, I think it still is somewhat because of UVA and Virginia Tech. But but DC was an ACC town for sure. But you're right. You know, I've said this before about Maryland that the best atmospheres I've been in in games usually were Duke or Carolina playing at Maryland back at Cole Fieldhouse. And then uh, when Comcast Center opened, and in the early 2000s, when Duke passed by Carolina as the most hated anything to the people at the University of Maryland, those atmospheres were incredible. Yeah, and, and I can guarantee you, Maryland, Maryland has not been able to come close to matching that in the Big Ten against any of those teams. No, and you go back to Cole Fieldhouse. Oh, that was great. Love you it. know, those were the most profane crowds. Oh yeah, you'd ever see. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's fourteen and a half thousand people at Cole Fieldhouse. Thirteen and a half thousand of them were male, and twelve thousand were highly intoxicated when they got there, <laughs> and like hated Dean crowd. Smith with a passion, and oh, hated like Coach K crowd. with a passion. It was like a UFC crowd. Absolutely. <laughs> Those those were the days, man. I know I hate to sound like old guy here, but those were the days. And right now, I think it's great that the ACC, the tournament documentary is running right now because the league has been so bad this year that it's kind of reminding people this league was the bellwether for decades. Yeah, absolutely. And it isn't right now. And they need to rekindle that. These schools that these schools that we talked about, they need to make coaching changes, hire guys that are committed to winning. Pay your damn coaches. Pay them. And I think the ACC very quickly could get back to its rightful perch, or what well, was once its rightful perch. Let me ask you this, because you were talking about the ACC. Which episode are you on? I think the, the next, the last four. Uh, okay. Because the stuff I talked about. You'll be on more than one? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on what, what stuff of mine they use. But I talked – the interviews that I did was about 2004 Maryland's ACC tournament title uh, when John Gilchrist went crazy, uh, J.J. Redick, and then the 05, 09, 17 Tar Heels, and then Roy Williams. Okay. Talked a lot about Roy Williams. So um, I did a couple hours, so I don't know how much of it they'll use. And they did – they've talked to some great people. So they're not using long snippets, so I have no idea. They never told me. I'll just have to watch it, wait and see, and and maybe they'll black out know. the screen when I'm when talking. They get all, when they get all the ratings back and 18 to 30 female demographics through the roof, we'll know which episode it was. I'll be the guy who's talking that they don't actually show. When I was on, when I was on, okay, very quickly before we close this out, I used to be on, when I was at Fox, I was on a football show, weekly football show with Tommy Bowden. And um, James Bates was called the new college football show. We were on for a couple of years and I was the ACC guy and they would bring me on for a couple of minutes and they'd show my face for like two seconds and they go straight highlights the rest of the way, baby. <laughs> they didn't want to affect viewership that much. So maybe that's what they'll do in the documentary. I don't believe that's what it was. <laughs> that's absolutely what it They just had some really good video clips. See, our, our our ratings will go. Oh, our view hits will go up if I just did the podcast like that. Uh, <laughs> All right, man. Hey, he's David. I'm AJ. We appreciate you guys stopping by.